My name's Dan Cochran. Um, I'm doing handcraft and leather goods since about 1995. Um, I've been doing the Harkin store here. Normally it's been Father's Day weekends for, I forget, before Ruth even came, which is 10 plus years. My Aunt Opal uh, used to be the site manager here and she, when she retired, um, I met Ruth and so I've had a real interest in the Old West and if this isn't really the Old West, I suppose, but just the 1800s in the, the, the second half and on. Uh, has been my interest. Uh, you're going to see modern stuff. You're going to see um, kind of a quasi-Western um, flavor to my uh, my products. Um, I started getting interested in this because people, you probably remember making leather projects in class, uh, shop class and things back in the day. Uh, there was a strong resurgence in the 50s and 60s, and that's kind of hung on through the years with Tandy Leather um, and some other individuals who do that. I kind of picked up the Western flair because I enjoy, enjoyed the, the lifestyle. Uh, this is a um, canteen cover. Uh, I should say it's a thermos bottle, basically. Uh, so it's all floral, and what will happen is that this will be laced just like the um, coffee cups, um, the mason jar, it's kind of the same principle, and it'll have a, a hook, a hook, a bale, leather strap, and it'll have a sewn-in bottom, and it will <clears throat> have a handle, probably right about here, so you can pour. Um, I've been using, what, I can't think of the name of the brand right now, but it's 64 ounce growler, they call them. Some people put alcohol in them. You can put hot or cold um, in them. And they've been a real popular item recently. Uh, so picking up floral um, in the last year and a half. Now, there's a guy in Cal Colorado that um, draws my artwork for me. Okay. I send him a pattern of the size I have and the layout I want and he will, Bob Blea is his name and he lives in the, um, yeah, Colorado. Uh, what's the big city out there? Denver, Denver Colorado. Uh, Dan, Dan, the Denver area, one of the suburbs and he is quite accomplished in what he does. A lot of his stuff he sells online but uh, I want to be a little different. There, there, there are floral patterns out there, but this was an opportunity for a reasonable price to have somebody actually do custom artwork for me. So he puts it on a piece of paper. He draws it just like you would a, a photograph, or a photograph, um, a drawing of any kind, artwork, pencil drawing is basically what it is. I take a piece of transfer paper, and uh, so I'm, I'm, transferring that onto wet leather with a stylist. I use this and it takes about an hour and a half to for this t uh, type project to put that on and then I start with a what's called a um, yeah it's a blade a swivel knife and after a while you get tired you know I found out with this intricate larger a pattern I have to wait uh, you know, while I did most of this last night, but I'm finishing up the flowers here. And then what I'll do is I'll start with a series of tools and the principle basically is that you pound down the non-essential surfaces so that the pattern itself up becomes apparent. It's, I don't know if they call that two-dimensional or what, but uh, I'm not much of an art uh, person, but I enjoy making nice looking things, as well as durable things, you know. Um, the, the carving itself, probably six to eight hours, I would guess, for this pattern. And then additional assembly would be uh, probably another two hours, I would guess. 
on that. Um, I've been selling them to the cowboy shooting um, sports people. They in um, Mankato, north of Mankato, in the um, oh, either I got to think of the name of the town or the. There's a gun, Almond's gun. Oh, yeah, it's east of Mankato. Yes, okay. Almond's has been around for 100 right. years. Right. So behind their gun store, they have a whole complex uh -huh. of cowboy shooting oh, and good. and uh, shotgun, uh -huh. um, skeet shooting things. But they built a fort, and they've got all kinds of little buildings, and then they've got two streets. Uh, just It's kind of like... A, Old West Town, mm -hmm. but it's just the fronts of the buildings. Wow. And then behind that is the shooting bays. And so in September, they have their regional cowboy shoot. The Single Action Shooting Society uh, awarded them that uh, probably four years ago now. And I've been there for, I don't know, again, probably 10 to 12 years. But um, I sell this kind of stuff to the guys. They have gun carts and they have their shotgun and their rifle, lever action rifle, and their and their handguns. And so it gets hot, you know. It's buggy. It can rain. It can fry them. Whatever, you know. And so they they've got have to be a cowboy. they've got all <laughs> kinds of stuff, yeah, out there to help them beat the heat, you know. And so this is one of those products that. Uh, Last year, we did this as a um, overall men's and women's award. The, the top shooters in the men and women's category got one of these oh, very nice. um, with the Gunsmoke logo in the center here. Um, so I'm kind of going back to this. It's not going to be an award this year. We're doing stools, but okay. I didn't bring the stools along. That's another I forgot to do thing. Is that a ceramic knife? It is, yes. And I find it <clears throat> a whole lot easier to keep sharp than trying to strop a, a metal, yeah. uh, steel or whatever, iron type thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's low maintenance. It's not historically correct by any means, but um, the tool itself has been around for pr quite a while. I would say at least the beginning of the 1800, or 1900s um, and then there's the other tools that go back even further um, I have a few of them like your strap cutters and things um, they, the harness tools um, that farmers would have used um, the, the, the sewing hand sewing uh, if you've seen the um, what do you call it the stitching ponies um, they're basically a, two pieces of wood that come together like a clamp and you sit on a bench that has this clamp on the end and then there's a strap that pulls those together to hold your piece while you s sew with two needles which is called saddle stitching. So I still use the saddle stitch on all my stuff. I don't do any machines. So you've got a stronger stitch than you would with a machine. Um, so, yeah, just some of those things. Um, I didn't think I had any kind of um, abilities for hobbies at the time. I was probably in my late 20s when I was doing retail. Um, I was in electronics, and um, my brother and I both were working high pressure jobs, neither one of us were married at the time, and we were working 60, 70 hours a week, and we just, we started to get tired of the grind. We, there was no really outlet other than sitting down and watching TV, and that got old pretty fast. So I started noticing people coming in to my store with uh, wallets and belts and checkbook covers, and I don't know what caused me to start taking notice, but um, they would tell me that a son or daughter had made it for them, or they themselves had made 
this checkbook or wallet, and I'd ask, well, how long have you had that? And anywhere from 20 to 40 years. And I was in a sales management position where the pressure was on to just perform, you know, over last year's numbers, over last month's numbers, and there really wasn't a whole lot of reward other than saying, yeah, I beat my numbers. And uh, I just, I saw something tangible that didn't go away, you know, a few months, few years. People, it would wear like iron, it was well taken care of. Um, and I, I said, hey, I think maybe I could do something like that. And I got, uh, funny you should say, black powder. I ended up going, I lived in Indi Indiana at the time, and I found out, before I even heard of Tandy Leather, I found out that there was a guy, Townsend and Son, uh, they're on the web and they're huge today. They're into the uh, colonial period. And they've got all that stuff in this little store. And I went up there, Pearson, Indiana, and didn't know anything about anything. And I picked up a, a simple roll of tools. It had a pair of those really uncomfortable scissors, you know, that don't have any, um, they're just a big round bow and you try to cut with them and they're like, oh man, this is hard work, you know, if you're doing heavy weather like this. So I ended up with some needles and some thread and I ended up finding out, you always do, that that really wasn't what you needed, but it got me started. And then I found out that there was a Tandy Leather in Indianapolis. And I started going down there and I'm getting leather and um, ended up working for them for like six months before the company got uh, bought out and reorganized and they closed my store. But I had enough under my belt by then that I was on my way to doing uh, leather work. And it really wasn't, I just kind of, I just kind of, I don't know, I guess limped along is a good word, from 95 till about 2000 when I moved up here. And I started doing some shows in New Ulm and um, found out about uh, Morristown and Almonds and ran into a guy who is a saddle maker named Mike Bray in Monticello. And you just can't pay money to have somebody take you under their wing and apprentice you. And that's what he did. And I, I grew, you know, leaps and bounds by his influence. And, um, and also the fact, I have to credit my wife, she, uh, she was raised in, a, in Gibbon here. And she... So 1986, I think they had an old farmhouse, and her parents used a rear washer. Till 1986, yeah. and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, Indiana, I I remember my grandparents having their first bathroom in the 60s in in Ohio. I mean, that was quite novel to me. You know, we got to do the the wash tub on the kitchen table kind of thing for baths when we were little kids but my wife had lived that way with an outhouse and everything until, you know, early. She was born in 67 and they didn't have a ringer washer until 86. And she learned all of the skills like crochet and um, knitting and, and uh, cross stitch and all that stuff. And so she really took my hand sewing to a new level and the lacing and all that. Uh, so I, you know, I've really grown a lot from just the influences of other, other people. First thing we do is we set the flower centers. Um, those are a little heavier tool, so I use a heavier mallet with the finer background stuff. I use this one pound, this is a two pound. Um, and my flower center's right there. And I set, set that there and just give it a couple good whacks. And that gives you my flower center. And then I start doing um, some 
uh, what they call um, I'll just set these first and then I'll show you the next step so all these flower centers um, I don't know if I have any floral over there I do have a little bit on that one bag if you took a shot of that that's kind of what this is going to look like generally so you see the flower center and then I start lifting the the uh, flower uh, petals around the edge there and then uh, pressing down the, the background that's another step so there's basically three or four steps there and then I, I'll do come back and do some knife cutting where with that tool I used first to just give it some uh, detail so I put that aside and this is the tool I use the hammer I use most of the time um, so uh, we can start with the lifter here and what it does is it just kind of goes underneath it gives the illusion of the petals being off the off the background and I'll probably go back and do this again after it's all done because you tend to mash it down with all the different steps that you do so uh, there's a couple things that have to be done a couple three times before you're all finished and so this is just all about making it look like it's real um, we don't want it to to just be a flat um, piece. I never really taught floral, so if it doesn't make sense, I uh, apologize for that. But maybe you can see from what I'm doing here um, how it comes together. And it's one of those things where a picture is worth a lot. Yeah, and so I go around in all of the petals and just pound in. It's amazing how all of this disappears after a while where you've gone into the other, the back of another part of the design that just all gets pressed down. And uh, so it's really, really fascinates me how these look so real after a while if you do it right. Um, there are some people that even go as far as painting their flowers to look like the real thing. I've stayed with a natural approach uh, at this point and just oiled it or dyed it maybe a solid color. So then what I do is I come in with a tool that begins to push down the background so that I can get it to lay down deeper and that's a beveling tool and that just goes like this you walk the tool down the cut line that you've made and that presses down everything and makes it easier for you to come in with a backgrounding tool and lay that uh, area down that you don't want to have uh, part of the design so yeah it's and it it takes you know some days I get it and other days I don't there's a they talk about walking the tool and this is one of those that you try to keep moving so it doesn't become choppy um, so um, I found out that you, the bigger your piece, the easier it is to use a hand tool on this stuff because you get these little tiny pieces and it's hard to hold them as well as the tool so that you can keep your tool moving smoothly. So I've taken to leaving my tooling pieces in, on a large background and cutting them out after I'm done and it makes it a whole lot easier. I'm gonna take a flower and I'm gonna show you what I do with the flower on 
the sure I don't know if you can see or not it's kind of dim over here but this is actually uh, part of the beveling and backgrounding on the flower might be easier to see um, what I'm doing here I'm going around coming down the the center line and I'm coming around the outside of the petal and I'll do the flowers first and then I'll start doing the vine work after that and so it the way I the way I do this beveling the order that I do it in makes the flower the petals look like they're laying a certain way so I'm going to come around here and I'm going to start here and hopefully they look like they're overlaying each other when I'm done. That's the idea. So, and any of all of this you'll start to see kind of gives it depth as I go, pressing the leather down. So if you look at this, you'll see a circular pattern to it. This is the Sheridan style of floral curving. Um, supposedly it originated out in Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, and I don't remember if it was a cowboy, but I'm, I'm gonna say that it was just a romanticized here. It was, pro it was probably a cowboy, a saddle maker, or whoever that developed the style out there. There's several different styles of floral carving and leather, but this is the one that caught my eye. Um, Al Stolman, who was well known for his carving and popularized the old style of floral, did a wonderful job, but I just could not bring myself to do that kind of acorn you remember the acorn and all of that um, it just didn't do anything for me but when I saw this I was I was impressed with the possibilities so so what we do here yeah. is we take um, let me get see if I got the right one we want to have one white enough that we press down the uh, center of the petal and make it look even more 3D. And so we're just bringing in, these are imaginary flowers, so you can do whatever you want to, but uh, it just, any depth you can give to them just really makes them pop. So kind of that way. Um, Part of it you can do it you can create your own flower yes you can there there are similarities in the style that you'll see but you look at the different artists um, that are doing this and it's just amazing the similarities but yet the distinctive style that they have uh, another guy named Tony Bernier lives in the Twin Cities and he just does some wonderful, uh, he draws his, all his own artwork. You'll see him doing um, like uh, Voyage to, um, what do you call it? Uh, he's a sci-fi guy, sort of. Um, he's done pieces that show the uh, Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, whatever that is, 10,000 Leagues. Yeah. He's got pieces that show this, the uh, guys in the book, you know, where they were down there harvesting some of the sea uh, gardens that um, the Nautilus had planted. And then he's got some Star Wars stuff that 
just, I mean, incredible detail. You just can't believe how he can achieve that on leather. You know, you see some things that people do on canvas, mm -hmm. and, um, but this guy is just amazing when it comes to, um, creates his own tools, you know. So there's just, you know, you can begin, you can be a beginner or you can be uh, totally advanced. Um, and you've got some really nice um, artists in the Uomo area too uh, that do all kinds of things. I'm not sure I call myself an artist, but a lot of, a lot of oils and, and photographs. This area is, even Redwood Falls has a lot of uh, art people. So there's a, there's a flower. This is what I love to do. It's handcrafted leather. My name is Dan Cochran, Logos Leathercraft, and I appreciate the opportunity to show it off. Thanks.